வெல்கம் வணக்கம் சுவாகதம் வாய் ஐ வில் நாட் டூ த ஒன் திங் தட் செவரல் ஆஃப் யூ ஆர் நவ் அர்ஜிங் மீ டு டூ ஜஸ்ட் எஸ்டர்டே ஐ ஷேர்ட் வித் யூ அ வீடியோ இன் விச் ஐ ரெஸ்பாண்ட் டு தி belification campaign now in progress against rahul gandhi in response to that i am getting several requests that i do another video a complimentary video dealing with sri narendra modi's educational background so that a tit for tat can be constituted I have to disappoint all those who are expecting me to do this. And I have to also say that only those who do not understand me aright will expect me to go along that track. At this time, I remember being contacted by Kiran Bedi, who subsequently became Kiran. the lieutenant governor of puducherry through a student of mine his name is blessen requesting that i write an article defending ms smriti irani who at that time had become the minister of education or as it was then known the human resource development minister of the central government a controversy had erupted about her dodgy educational background and kiran bedi wanted me because of my academic standing as the principal of st stephen's college to write a piece which would obviously which would obviously be published um defending uh, smriti irani i refused to oblige not because i was indifferent to smriti irani I try to be indifferent to none to the extent possible. I'm a man of very limited physical energies, capacities and therefore I can't be fighting everybody's battles. I can't fight my own battles. I don't fight several of the battles that I should have fought. I refuse to uh, oblige uh, Kiran Bedi simply because these things don't really interest me. As far as I am concerned, the educational background of Smriti Irani, no matter how dodgy it is, how dubious it is, how fraudulent it is, is nothing compared to whatever merit she can exemplify or bring to bear on the work she is doing at the present time. Is she competent at the work that is assigned to her? is she in a position position to do justice to her duties as the education minister for a huge country like india then her educational background really doesn't matter to me it may matter to others but of course it, there is a substantial element of truth in saying that a person with sound educational background and a proven track record of being engaged with the agenda of education in india will be in a far better position to do justice to the duties comprehended in the office of the minister for human resource development than somebody who does not have a comparable background and a reassuring uh, track record that goes without saying anyway uh, the fact of the matter is that i did not oblige for the same reason i am not going to oblige the request that i do a program or a, a video on sri narendra modi's educational background uh, not necessarily because i fear consequences or reprisals there could be reprisals and i have no hesitation in admitting that i am not above fear i am not a very heroic character but honest to god it's not fear that makes me refrain from doing this particular Uh, video at this point in time then why did i respond to the video uh, or or the attempt to or, or, uh, orchestrate a vilification campaign against rahul gandhi 
I did so for the reason that I thought I clearly spelt out in the video shared with all of you earlier. Namely, I find in this particular process a pattern of serious concern for me as someone who has invested a lifetime in the domain of education, whose vision for education is not merely that I should participate in the formation of the lives of the students who are entrusted to me, but also that as a teacher, I should stay engaged with the unfolding destiny of India. Without any exaggeration, I can tell you that I sincerely believed that not a classroom in St. Stephen's College, but the whole of India was my classroom. That's the spirit, that's the vision with which I taught. So, that vision endures with me even to this day and that's the reason why I feel inwardly impelled, compelled to respond to issues of national significance, especially where broad patterns and principles are involved. And as regards the attempt to dig up the past of Rahul Gandhi in order to discredit the promise that he holds at the present time is concerned. I see in it a huge problem, a problem of general significance. And I thought it was my duty as a one-time teacher and a lifetime teacher, though now retired, to alert the country, if not to educate the country, because educating in the country is a very uh, exalted concept. I am unequal to that task. I can only share some concerns, thoughts and insights with those who care to listen to me. And I am glad and grateful there are so many of you who take what I say seriously or at least pay attention to what I have to say. Now therefore I thought in this video, uh, to the extent that perhaps I may not have made my intention or my point of engagement with this process clear enough, I will make that a little more clear uh, so that uh, my standpoint and my sense of purpose can be understood. Um, what is my concern here? My concern is that a person, let me go, uh, very briefly go back to the previous video and the context in which that video was done. A person who goes all out to invent, to discover, to marshal, every possible piece of evidence in order to cause huge embarrassment to a young leader like Rahul Gandhi. He's no longer very young. He's 54 years of age, but he is young compared to me. Therefore, I always think of him as a young leader uh, and thinks that that is the greatest service he can render to India. And that is something uh, about which obviously he feels hugely delighted personally as though he has done some great thing, as though he has climbed the, the Everest or something like that. This bogus, this spurious, this specious sense of personal achievement, the sense of self-validation. Now here, please understand that there are two ways in which we can seek self-validation. Everybody wants to be validated. Everybody wants one sense of self to be realized and if possible acknowledged by others. That's why everybody attaches so much importance to how other people respond to us. And that's called public acceptance or public acclaim, which is a degree higher than mere acceptance as all of us know. Now, uh, I am totally convinced, at least that at least for me, this is the highest goal in life, and that is how to attain the highest, most fulfilling and fruitful state of my individuality. My first duty, I sincerely believe, is to myself. I have to take good care of myself, by which I mean not merely adding on to the material circumstances of a comfortable living. By taking good care of myself, I mean attaining the highest possible degree of self-development. Under the circumstances possible, we are all limited to an extent, not completely, but to an extent by the circumstances in which we live and grow up. What's called circumstantial pressures. 
But I, I don't believe that we are mere playthings in the hands of circumstances. We are also given the power to transcend and triumph over the limitations of circumstances. And to the extent that we do so, our personality becomes more and more individualized and accentuated. This is the process that the great psychologist or psychiatrist Carl Jung referred to as the process of individuation. Uh, one, of, one of his major contributions to European thinking is the concept of individuation, which is the strenuous, painful process of becoming an individual. At birth, we are not individuals. We are only the seeds of individuality. Seeds of every baby, every infant is only a seed of individuality. And what should happen over a period of time through the mysterious process of growth and development is that that particular individual which stands or starts at ground zero, uh, slowly, painfully moves towards greater and higher levels of individuation. That's the accentuation of one's personality. Now, unfortunately, there is a paradox here. And that is, in theory, everyone will immediately agree, acknowledge, endorse the view that attaining the highest degree of selfhood or individuality is a very noble, essential and indefeasible goal. Every human being owes this duty to himself and herself to attain the highest possible degree of one's individuality. In theory, this will be readily conceded. But the irony or the paradox is this, that while in theory this is conceded, in practice this is completely either denied or ignored. So much so, you look around and see how many people are actually acting on this conviction or this general theory that the most fundamental and the most inalienable duty we owe to ourselves is to attain the highest degree possible of our own individuality. How many of us can claim that we have really done so? I can claim with hand on heart that I have made a feeble attempt at least in that direction and also therefore testify from personal experience that it's not an easy thing to do because our society is organized in a manner that makes this adventure of life the most difficult and sometimes the most hazardous one. So, what happens? Rather than seek to attain the fullest possible extent of one's own individuality, people readily, freely, voluntarily agreed to be mere appendages, mere footnotes, mere ghostly pale fixtures of this camp or that camp, this party or that party. And in some cases, this individual or that individual, this hero or that uh, hero uh, or that heroine, this film actor or that film actress, this politician or that politician. <laughs> I consider this to be an insult to oneself. Because in this kind of a life that many people, unfortunately the majority of people choose to lead this kind of life, you are in a bankrupt state in which you have to borrow from others whatever sense of worth or importance you would like to attach to yourself. That's why people sort of, uh, you know, move closer to certain centers of influence or drop certain names or uh, pretend to be uh, connected to this or that, that or pretend to be the defender of this political party, this ideology and therefore feels obliged to the enemy of so and so. Now let me say this to you that no self-respecting individual will degrade himself to the level of allowing himself or herself to be used as a tool in this kind of muckraking undertaking. It is like, um, it is a piece of scavenging. What this gentleman that I referred to in the previous video is doing, he is actually doing scavenging. That's why I am saying I feel sad for him 
because it shows that he's trying his level best and he's willing to demean himself to any extent. He's trying his level best to derive some sense of self-importance by doing this kind of muckraking which he thinks will increase his worth in the eyes of a particular individual or a set of individuals or a particular camp or an enclave of opinion or agenda, whatever. And only a person who has absolutely no self-respect, no sense of self-worth will degrade himself, demean himself in this manner. That's the reason why I thought I would respond to it. This is something that no self-respecting individual should do. Because after all, you're not doing something which is expressive of your character and your conviction. You're doing something only because you think that by doing this, and even if you have to do it out of character, by violating the integrity of your own being, by doing this, you will ingratiate yourself to a certain group or a certain center of power. And perhaps there is some material benefit to be reaped thereof. We do not know, at least I don't know. I don't want to speculate. My concern here is that in this kind of attitude to life, the individual miserably fails poignantly fails to do justice to himself. I believe this is a tragedy that should happen to none. And therefore, in order to attain some clarity of thought, let me share the following thoughts. And I beg of you to lend your ears to me in this, the following, the ensuing thoughts. What does it mean to attain this degree of essential, inalienable individuality which is universally acknowledged, as I said a, said a short while ago, universally acknowledged as one of the basic duties that every human being owes to himself or herself. But as I said again, most to which most individuals are indifferent and uh, um, uh, most individuals fail to take a single step in that direction. I believe and it's not something that I alone believe. Many thinkers in the past have said so, and I'm influenced by a whole tradition of thinking in what I'm going to share with you, that human, the expression and consolidation of human individuality has three components, three components. Very easy to remember. The first is the freedom to think and to form and open opinion according to one's own particular personality, value systems, uh, personal orientation uh, and the kind of uh, distinct, unique human being one is. In contradistinction to that, we have the idea today in this world of public, public opinion, everybody becoming a consumer of public opinion and public opinion is any opinion other than your own opinion. So if you remain a consumer of public opinion, you will never develop an opinion on your own, which means that you do not even get started in the process of becoming an individual. If you're only a dumping ground for other people's views and opinions, then how do you start becoming a human being and an individual who thinks for himself? So the first step in becoming a well-defined individual, effective individual who can value and respect himself, it doesn't matter if others don't respect me, but it matters whether or not I'm able to, able to respect myself. Woe unto me if I have to live in a state of self-revulsion. So the first step towards becoming an individual in the proper dynamic vital sense of the word is to think and develop opinions by oneself. The second step is, and the, all these are fundamental freedoms enshrined in the constitution of India, not really the constitution of India. In fact, they're enshrined in all documents of fundamental human rights formulated especially in the last 100 years and uh, more particularly after 1948, the Universal, Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948, which was preceded by the formulation of several 
codes of human rights. I don't want to take you into the details of the history of the formation of this stream of thought uh, because they are fairly well known to most people. So the first step is the freedom to think and form opinions for oneself as against imbibing the opinions of others and going around parroting. As far as this individual who has created this very powerful post which he thinks is sufficient to destroy Rahul Gandhi and knock him out of the scene altogether is concerned. He is not acting on personal convictions or he is not even articulating personal opinions. He is merely doing something which he thinks will please X, Y or Z uh, somewhere out there. It's not, it cannot be considered as a piece of self-expression. The second aspect is you must not only think and form opinions, that freedom is given to you and you exercise that, but that's not enough. You have to also articulate your opinions and your forms of thought or your insights. That freedom is very important. Now, suppose I do a lot of thinking and I come to significant, significant conclusions, but I stay in unbroken silence. I don't utter a word. I don't share my insights with anyone. It's as good as not having them because we are all social creatures. We have a need to share with others whatever good things we have. I have a need to listen to you just as you have a need to listen to me. We are social creatures. Our bonding with each other is strengthened by what we share. And that's the reason why I make it a point to read every word written as responses in the column, in the uh, response box of the YouTube channel. I don't miss a single response from anyone so far, though uh, I have to say that it's extremely time consuming. But I somehow find the time to do so because I attach so much value to every word that is written in response to what I share with you because this give and take is something to which I attach great value and importance. So two freedoms and two duties, the, in this case freedom and duty are one, the freedom and the duty to think for oneself and to form opinions, one's own opinions. Second stage is the freedom and the duty to articulate, to express those opinions with others so that why is this is important? So that others who listen to you or become aware of your line of thought are in a position to offer their honest response either by your endorsement or by your honest, truthful criticism, giving you the opportunity to correct your views and to make your thinking more factual and more comprehensive and closer to truth. That's something extremely important. Our sense of self-worth is directly proportionate to the degree of conviction that we have that we are coming closer and closer and closer to truth. And if I stay confined to my own opinions, there is no guarantee that I am anywhere near the truth. On the other hand, if I share my opinions with you in honesty, sincerity, hiding nothing from you, no hidden agenda, no ulterior motive and you have the full freedom to say what you are convinced about, uh, making it a rational uh, formulation of your criticism of what I say, then we have a sharing of minds through which you and I are in a better position to come closer to the truth together. So in this quest for truth, you and I are fellow travelers in this pilgrim path of seeking and finding the truth. To me, this is a very valuable, beautiful and rewarding experience. And that it is this that sustains my tremendous effort, which I have to tell you is not easy for me to sustain, effort to maintain this YouTube fellowship and share with you every day uh, at least two to three videos. Now, we have examined two aspects of becoming individuals, the third aspect and that is we have not only the freedom and the duty to think and form opinions, that's the first thing, we have not only the freedom and the duty to share with others the fruits of our thinking or the opinions and insights formulated, third we have also the freedom and the duty to act according to our insights our thoughts, our convictions. It's only when we bring our convictions or our insights into action 
or it's only when we give effect our thoughts and insights that our individuality becomes fully accentuated. That's why if you stay inactive, gradually without your knowing it, you begin to lose your sense of self-worth, your self-worth gets daily eroded and you become hollow and empty within. And you slip into the most unfortunate state of having to live in a state of resentment and frustration with oneself, which is then taken out on others. And people in this plight always imagine themselves as victims of other people's uncharity, whereas the fact of the matter is that they neglected themselves and they dodged the duty, the most sacred duty, to develop their individuality in the manner that I have so simply and briefly indicated. And I'm saying this out of my personal experience. I've experienced my personality, my individuality at its highest point of realization. When I thought, I shared and I acted. Now this gives us a simple checklist as to where we stand in relation to the development of our individuality. With this checklist, now examine the plight of this gentleman who thinks that his greatest contribution to humankind is that he went far back about 30, 35 years and dug up some stinging material and he's projecting it and presenting it to the discerning public of India. That is his great contribution. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to slip into that miserable, despicable, obscene state. That's the reason why I will not go and dig up the past to the Prime Minister. It is up to his conscience. It is up to his sense of dignity and uh, self-worth. And I am happy to leave it at that. And I suggest that that is the best way to deal with it. Because otherwise we will corrupt our own personality. To the extent possible, let's stay focused on what is right and righteous, what is positive and life-affirming. At the same time, I'm realistic enough to concede that when we live in a corrupt society, when we live in an epoch of evil, disorder and malignancy, it becomes necessary and unavoidable to become critical, to expose certain uh, stinging realities and to take a negative stand or a stand of resistance against the rot that is in progress. But that must be done, as G.K. Chesterton so beautifully puts, that must be done out of good intentions in an attitude of love. In one of his uh, books, I can't remember the title now, and I've quoted him in one of my my own books. And I think in my, I've quoted him in my memoir titled uh, On a Stormy Course. G.K. Chesterton says, only a lover can be a reformer. Beautiful. Please remember this. Only a lover can be a reformer. And while quoting him, I'm also reminded of the words of St. Paul, who says, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Now, as far as this person who is, has dedicated his love to embarrassing Rahul Gandhi is concerned, if he is pointing these things out, out of a concern to reform Rahul Gandhi, to lead him to a higher state of perfection, growth, achievement, etc., most welcome. I would embrace him. But clearly that is not his intention. His intention is to destroy what little good there might be in a fellow human being, which I believe is diabolic, it is satanic. And it's not something that any one of us sh should imitate. We should not go anywhere near that line of operation. And I certainly will not do that in relation to uh, whether it is Pradeer Rani or whether it is the Prime Minister or with respect to anybody else. And even though my bread and butter was higher education, I have to tell you, that not everything is learned in schools, colleges and universities. Looking back upon my, my own life, I can tell you that 
I have learned, whatever I have learned in schools, colleges and universities is only about 5% of what I have learned ever since. My real education started after I finished my formal education. And that's what is called lifelong learning. And I'm very grateful to the Almighty for giving me the wisdom to maintain this discipline lifelong. Realizing that the real joy in life issues only out of the reality of one's continuous growth towards perfection. I'm not claiming that I've attained it, but I can certainly claim without any fear of contradiction that my struggle to go closer and closer and closer to perfection continues unabated to this day, to this day. And that's the one thing that fills my life, life with happiness. I wish that joy to become universal. Unfortunately, people like this gentleman who is an expert only in gutter inspection and muckraking, I feel sad for him because what's the kind of emotional, psychological state in which he is? What is the sense of self-realization? What is the quality of his individuality? And what is the vibration he radiates to people all around him, including his own household? If he has children, would his children feel encouraged by his presence? Would he as a father be able to bring out the best from his own children? If he allows his personality to be deformed, misshapen in this manner, directed entirely towards the negative, ridiculous, dark and dismal, capable only of inducing despair and hopelessness in anyone who is sensitive. I believe, and I have to say this with great reluctance, I believe that being a person of that kind is the highest or the worst punishment ever. In comparison to this, capital punishment is a relief. Being a person of this kind is the worst punishment in itself that you can imagine. I sincerely hope and pray that this would not happen to many more people. Let's think positive. Let's dare to believe that the grass is still green under our feet. Let's believe that great things are possible. Let's believe that in spite of the gloom and the doom all around, that beyond the thickest hours of darkness in the night, this gentle radiance of a new dawn is shaping. That's the mystery of God's creation. It's bound to happen. Life, as I've said in one of my previous videos, is a pendular swing. It doesn't always stay stuck here. If today it's here, in this depth of despair, it will swing the other way. Better days will come. And there will be time to celebrate, to laugh, to embrace each other. A time to live free from fear. A time when we can embrace each other as brothers and sisters. A time to celebrate the, the, the beauty, the purity, the goodness and the glory of life together. That's what it means to be human. That dream of such a day. Whether that day will come before I close my eyes forever, I don't know. But I'll never give up that hope. Because I love my country. I love you. I love myself. Jai Hind. Jai Hind.